Hello everybody, good morning and thank you very much for joining us this morning. You are very welcome. Um, we have a huge array of people that have registered for the webinar from all around the globe, so we are thrilled to be able to present to you today. We will be there will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation for questions. So if you could please pop your questions into the Q&A um, area, then we will go through them systematically. But please don't worry, if we don't get to them all, what we will do is dissipate them through the team and send you a written answer. So please do, uh, please do ensure that you put your questions in to us. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce the presenters this morning and um, I'll hand over now to Ella, who will take you through the introduction and, and um, introduce herself to you. Thanks very much, Polly. So good morning, everybody. My name is Ella Mosley. I am the Technical Director of Ecology at Gavia Environmental, and I specialise in terrestrial ecology and more specifically in biodiversity net gain. And my real passion is realising ambitious conservation objectives through biodiversity led design. And alongside me this morning is my colleague Jasmine. Hi, I'm Jasmine. So I'm a senior ecologist at Gavia Environmental and I specialise in biodiversity net gain, working with our clients to design for biodiversity and supporting our clients through the planning process. My other key skills include protected species surveys and ecological appraisals. And we're joined by Mike from Storm Geomatics. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Hopkins. I'm managing director of Storm Geomatics. I've been uh, a geospatial surveyor now for 36 years, would you believe? And for the last 16 years, um, we built a surveying company that focuses on measurement in the river corridor to better understand river behaviour and condition. Our measurements are used to inform flooding and environmental projects. I'm also a um, biodiversity manager for a sister company called Storm Wildlife, which is a biodiversity net gain management company that owns and maintains a registered biodiversity net gain offsetting site. Back to you, Ella. Thanks, Mike. So the key message that we're looking to convey in today's webinar is that as we find ourselves locally and globally in a biodiversity and climate emergency, we have a real opportunity to harness the mechanisms that are available to, uh, to us for improvement, enhancement and restoration, such as biodiversity net gain. And we can make a tangible difference to our present and future by doing so. The purpose of BNG is to leave a site in a measurably better condition than that in which it was found at the outset. And by specialists combining their technical expertise, such as those that we're about to detail to you, we can save time, money, and make genuine achieve achievable and long lasting improvements to biodiversity in a way that works better with the changing climate and the functionality and composition of the landscapes in which we work. So after over a decade of development from early studies and metric trials to the process that has led us from the metric two to the statutory metric and river condition assessment, we finally reached an exciting place where BNG has become mandatory for major development. And whilst there are several exemptions to BNG assessments, such as householder applications and urgent crown developments, the majority of sites do require an assessment. Area, linear and watercourse habitats are treated separately and must achieve a minimum of a 10% net gain where each grouping is impacted. And for rivers, a separate river condition assessment is required where the red line planning boundary is 0 to 10 metres from the bank top. Storm Geomatics and Gavia offer expertise across a number of disciplines to provide a robust and highly detailed assessment of a site's biodiversity, as well as the risk factors that may influence design, more of which we will cover on this later. So this flowchart shows our approach to biodiversity net gain, and we're going to go through each of these stages in detail, but just to provide you with a bit of an overview. The first step is strategic, strategic land search and optioneering. So this is where we can be involved to help you choose your site. So you may have several options and you want to understand which are going to, the most, going to be the most viable in terms of biodiversity net gain or ecology. And this is where we can help. So once you've chosen a site, we'll then do a detailed habitat survey, including baseline biodiversity net gain condition assessments. We'll then feed into the design process, highlighting constraints and opportunities to ensure we are designing for biodiversity net gain. 
Once we have a frozen design, we'll input this into the statutory metric and ensure we are achieving a minimum of 10% net gain. There may be some need to revise the design slightly or look at off-site options if we're not achieving that net gain on site, um, but we'll look at this in more detail later. And this stage also includes the production of a biodiversity net gain report. So once we've got that finalised design and we've got that elite, the minimum of 10% net gain, we then prepare a habitat management and monitoring plan. And then all of these documents that I've mentioned above will all be submitted as part of the planning application. And following a planning permission and implementation of the development, we can then be involved in the monitoring visits during the 30 year biodiversity net gain period. At each stage, there would be valuable input from both Gavia and Storm Geomatics areas of expertise. Our offering is superior as it feeds into the planning system and we can work together from the early stage optioneering through to habitat management and monitoring plans and on site delivery. So let's start with the first stage, which is strategic land search and optioneering. Ella, please, can you walk us through this? Thanks, Chas. So strategic land searches and optioneering assessments are effectively two levels of a desk space assessment. The first of which is simply a study of several or a single sites, which are options for the development, which can be undertaken using publicly available information, as well as the most up to date satellite imagery. And we'd work with our clients to review objectives, design requirements and parameters, as well as budgets to feed into this land search. So this is a highly cost effective initial assessment. And the aim of this is to better understand the risks and opportunities for habitats and species. However, this doesn't constitute a full assessment for planning and therefore it must be followed by a detailed field survey. So once the site is selected, we can review routes, off-site locations and the placement of infrastructure to further refine the site selection and ensure our time spent on site is as efficient and effective as possible. We'll then complete a desk-based pre-assignment of the habitats before completing our site survey. All of our desk-based assessments review the wider landscape, priority and irreplaceable habitats, and even consider climate tra trends, which ultimately not only better informs our clients, but helps focus our site surveys and sets us up to help design for biodiversity from the outset, thus avoiding, as far as reasonably practicable, species, habitats and BNG risks. Working together with our internal teams and the experts at Storm Geomatics will ensure that our desk assessments factor in risks such as flooding, severance of landscape and habitat connectivity, contaminated land and crossing of utilities and impacts upon habitats and species. So next, Jasmine is going to take us through how we will use this information to inform field surveys and how we jointly approach these assessments. Thanks, Ella. So yeah, as touched on by Ella, prior to completing a field survey, we would undertake a desk-based assessment where we classify and map habitats from satellite imagery and base mapping. We then undertake a field survey, and this can be undertaken jointly or individually, dependent on, upon the site and its composition. So the joint approach requires the same amount of effort and cost as it would if only Gavia or Storm, Storm Geomatics were attending site. This is because the same number of surveyors would be used, but there would just be at least one from each of the disciplines, so we can make use of both of our areas of expertise. So the purpose of this site visit would be for us to ground truth the desk-based mapping we've done, and we'd use our extensive experience and expertise to classify habitats and undertake botanical identification. We'd also undertake the baseline biodiversity net gain condition assessments. In terms of storm geomatics role on site, if a river is present, they would undertake a detailed river channel survey and baseline river condition assessment to feed into the main biodiversity net gain assessment. They can also undertake soil sampling and LIDAR modelling of the site to assist with design development, picking up information such as tree heights, archaeological features and flood flow paths. However, we'll come on to this in more detail later in the webinar. So the other crucial role that Storm Geomatics will play in the site visit is accurately mapping and measuring the habitats on site, including area, linear and watercourse habitats. The equipment that ecologists use for mapping cannot provide the level of detailed accuracy that those at Storm Geomatics have access to, and so our accuracy is limited by our equipment. So Mike, can you just talk us through the importance of accurate measurements for biodiversity net gain and explain the level of accuracy your equipment can record? Thanks, Jazz. Yeah, so the size of a habitat is a multiplier in the BNG equation. 
So we really need to focus on accurate measurement to get the best value out of our site. And let's let's have a look how how sensitive is uh, size to BNG. If you could just yeah. And let's have a look at um, a, a real world example, which is the, the, the plan you see in front of you, which is Halford Flood Meadow. Um, so this flood meadow is a um, an offsetting site, but so this is creating biodiversity. But if you're a developer and you're taking away biodiversity, it's just the reverse thing. The equation is the same. So on this particular site, we were trying to create biodiversity and you can see different shaded areas uh, signify different habitats. So let's have a look at um, what we've got here, Jazz. So we've got 5.008 hectares of area habitats. And we've we've designed an improvement plan or a management plan to provide an uplift of 24.37 biodiversity units. So this this meadow was basically improved grassland and we're creating um, uh, a species rich grassland um, of, a, of a floodplain type. And we are um, also creating orchards, which are the shaded areas and scrapes along the middle, middle of the meadow. So 5.08 hectares, what does that actually mean? It, it, it produces 25.37 biodiversity units. So Jazz, let's have a look at the next line. So that is creating 4.80 biodiversity units per hectare. And the next slide, please. And the value of, so if the value of each biodiversity unit, let's say is 30,000 pounds, I mean, it, it, that's that's a sort of mean value at the moment as, the, as we see the market forming. And the next line, please. So the value of each hectare in uplift of bio, biodiversity units is 144,000 pounds. That's quite a lot of money per hectare. If you ask any farmer, um, what they get out of a hectare of, of land, it won't be any anything like that. But just remember that's for 30 years. So for each value of each metre square, um, it's £14.40 per metre square. So how sensitive is this particular site to this? Well, this field, the perimeter distance around this field is 1.4 kilometres. Now, if we didn't have accurate measuring techniques, which we have to the nearest 20 millimetres, and we were sketching this on an Ordnance Survey plan, and we were, say, one metre out all the way around this field, at the value of £14.40 per metre square, we would, we would be uh, miscalculating this in monetary terms by £20,160. That's quite a lot of money, um, and it's a lot more money than you would spend on an accurate survey to get to get the job surveyed accurately. So there's, there's one example of how you can save yourself £20,000 by, by using um, uh, a, a surveying company that can measure to 20 millimetres rather than just sketching on an ordnance survey plan. So let's move on, please, Jazz. That was, um, that we, we were talking there about uh, an area biodiversity net gain site. Um, let's have a look at uh, a water course here. So storm geomatics, we have surveyors that um, have the river condition assessment qualification and the river condition assessment is um, a large part of the biodiversity net gain calculation for water courses and because stor storm geomatics have um, a huge experience in surveying rivers and being in rivers all the time um, we we are we are able and trained safety wise to enter into rivers. Now in the river condition assessment course, 
they say that you can do a river condition assessment from the top of the river bank, but you are going to miss vital measurements if you do that. You need to get into the river. Now, here's one reason why you need to get into the river. The river type is a really important factor in a river condition assessment. So in front of you, you can see types A to M, and they all have different uh, plan forms. So plan form, or the shape of the river, as you see it on like a satellite imagery or a map, and bed material really make up the majority of what type of river you're looking at. So it's very easy to um, establish the plan form, but it's not so easy to establish the bed material, especially if you can't get in the river to get the bed material out. And as you can see, if you look at types G, I and L in this example here, they all take the same plan form, but they all have a different bed sediment, bed material. Now, this is really important, the, the type, the river type, because what the river condition assessment sets out to do is it looks to observe 32 condition indicators for each river. So we're observing things like vegetated um, sidebars. Um, we're looking at trees in the river, trees on the bank, wherever the trees are. So, for instance, um, uh, Pipe L River wouldn't have a vegetated sidebar, whereas Type G River is very likely, or Type I is pro probably likely to have one. So if we get the wrong river type to start with, we could be looking for positive indicators within that river that can't possibly be there. So the river type is really important and getting that bed material right makes a big difference. If we go on to the next slide, Jazz, this is this is this is the form that you fill in to, to collect your bed material. So you, what you do is you you look at your 10 meter or 20 meter stretch of river, which is dependent on width, and you you note down the abundance of these bed materials in front of you. Now, if you can't see because the river is turbid, then you're not going to get this information. So you're not going to be able to understand the bed materials in the river and work out what type of river you've actually got. So you really do need to get into the river. And when I did my um, assessment for um, becoming a rib condition assessment qualified person, um, which you have to have if you're going to um, do anything to do with biodiversity net gain on your site, you need to have a, a qualified person to do this. I actually failed my assessment because if you look at the difference here between um, very fine sand and silt, they could both be the same size particles, but there's absolutely no way you're going to be able to see from the riverbank a particle size of 0.05 of a millimetre. But in my, on the river I was assessing, um, the, 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 the bed material was like orange and it looked fine. So I said, that's sand. So that classified my river as one type, whereas actually the assessor said it was actually silt and um, that classified it into a different type. So what happened was all the things I expected to see in a, in a, in a, in a sand based river weren't there because it was actually a silt river I was comparing the results to. So you need to get in the river because sand feels gritty, clay feels sticky and silt feels smooth. So you need to actually touch and feel the bed materials. So that's, an, that's another reason why you need um, safety qualified people doing these river condition assessments so they can enter the river safely uh, and get that information. Another thing here is channel shape. Yeah, that's right, Jess, thank you. Um, so channel shape, 
these are the measurements you need for each morph um, module and there are five modules that make up a morph five so five times in each mo in each module you need to make these measurements okay now i don't know if anybody's ever tried to measure a river here with a tape measure um horizontally you might be all right if you've got a bridge um, but if you're wading through this river um, with a tape measure you've got trees and vegetation horizontally you might get away with it but vertically how are you going to do that in all honesty right you can go in with um, an old level and staff um, and you can try and get these measurements but we have state-of-the-art equipment to do this what you see in front of you those measurements are measurements that after bears do every single day um, we do these measurements for flood risk mapping and modeling projects but also for flood risk assessments which is another should another thing you're likely to have on a development site that's got a water course on it we provide flood risk assessment uh, measurements for for modeling hydraulic modeling to predict where the water can get to on your on your development site but here we have some very important measurements if we get these measurements wrong we're likely to misclassify um, the final outcome of the river condition assessment which is the which is the, the score of the river the condition score and that's because if if the river is if you like deeper than it is wide or 50 percent of that as you could see in the text there then the river is deemed to be over deep and if the river is over deep it then goes down a whole class so that has a consequence um, to your project if you don't get those measurements right and you don't or, or you don't class your river as over deep for instance what it means is that you're saying that this river readily connects with its floodplain and so you get the 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 um riparian areas the the bank crests you get those wet they're able to support a different type of habitat but if you get those measurements wrong and it's actually over deep you're you, you're not going to be able to create those habitats because the river does not connect with its riparian margins so so it's really important that this information is is correct for the success of your project going forward and um you know this is why measurement is so important it's a factor in every single um biodiversity net gain calculation areas sizes shapes like this but also you know bed materials so i think that's me done is it just i think is it back to you or is it ella over to ella thank you so storm dramatics can produce a digital twin that acts as an interactive and a highly detailed visual aid that will allow our clients to see details such as species topography and landform shading uh, from landscape features flood paths and archaeological features as well as tree heights and woodland composition and using this model soil and habitats and uh, data as well as species um, data from our uh, original field surveys um, in conjunction with an analysis of climate change data such as rainfall we can also support our clients into designing a biodiversity-led master plan that will successfully capture all factors relevant to the development from feature placement needs such as those that we find with solar panels to accommodating local planning requirements and restrictions by working with the landscape. And using this digital model helps us to visualise the landscape in its current state and assist with the design process by highlighting areas that we need to avoid and opportunities for enhancement or habitat creation that will not impact the success of the development. And in conjunction with our field habitats, species and soils data, we can ensure that biodiversity enhancement and habitat creation for all habitat groupings have a much greater chance of success. Our ultimate aim is to create a biodiversity focused, feasible, achievable and ultimately realistic design. 
And where watercourses are present on site and costly in-channel works are required, we understand that terrestrial habitat condition and enhancement can suffer. And in these instances, it's all the more essential that ecologists and geospatial surveyors work closely together to find practical and pragmatic, as well as nature-focused solutions that ultimately don't compromise area or linear habitats in order to improve the watercourse. So next, we're going to have a look at how we actually achieve that 10% net gain. You're on mute, Jazz. Hi, sorry. Um, so thanks, Ella. So yeah, we're now at the stage where we have a frozen design that has been developed with ecologists and geospatial surveyors, and we need to use this within the biodiversity net gain statutory metric. So we'll combine watercourse area and linear baselines and interventions and the, to reach your biodiversity net gain score. So hopefully we've achieved that 10% net gain in all of these habitat types the first time round. And the likeliness of this happening on the first trial is much greater if the above steps are undertaken and we are instructed as early as possible in the process. But if we're not reaching 10% net gain for any of the habitat types, or if the training rules aren't satisfied, then we'll discuss this with the client um, and we'll discuss other on-site options for meeting the required net gain. So this may include changing the types of habitats created or enhancing some retained habitats. But sometimes we can't always get that 10% net gain on site. So Ella, could you just tell us what happens in these situations? Yeah, of course. So while our primary focus is to compensate for unavoidable losses on site, there are inevitably going to be instances where this just can't be achieved. So for certain projects, it may be possible to undertake a desk space and sometimes field survey of the surrounding sites from the outset, but this isn't always feasible. So our approach would be to recommence our land search and optioneering process with the addition of the knowledge that we've gained through assessing the principal development site. And we'd look at influencing factors such as the habitats that are in deficit and the composition of the surrounding land to support the creation or enhancement of the same or similar habitat type as well as impacts upon habitat connectivity and the use of those habitats by mobile species. We would focus our search on, on sites that are in close proximity to the development um, in line with net gain guidelines um, and either in current ownership um, by the landowner or sites that are available to manage or purchase within the planning authority boundary. And where this just isn't possible, we would look as a last resort at the BNG site register and consider the purchase of units. Thanks, Ella. So once this 10% net gain has been achieved, whether that be on site or off site, Gavia Environmental will produce a habitat management and monitoring plan with input from storm geomatics relating to the watercourse elements. Gavia also have in-house water environment, hydrology, peat and contaminated land specialists who can also input into the habitat management and monitoring plan and provide their expertise in the relevant sections. So the habitat management and monitoring plan will be highly detailed and include an assessment of soils, adaptive management techniques and post-development monitoring. It will also include maps and visualisations to understand what success will look like. So the monitoring and management prescriptions will take into account things like land use and climate change to set realistic and achievable goals for the proposed habitat types and condition. The Habitat Management and Monitoring Plan will secure your legal agreement for biodiversity net gain and will be submitted to the local planning authority in draft format with the planning application to facilitate their comments. We can then update the plan following their comments. So our planning application packs include our for the full metric, the condition assessments, sheets uh, and river condition calculations where needed, reporting, imagery and mapping, as well as the habitat management and monitoring plan as a standard. Um, but, and our, our aim ultimately is to see our clients through the planning process from early consultation to post-consent discharge of conditions and then to support them with long term monitoring. And that leads me on to monitoring visits. So to ensure the success of habitat creation and enhancement, ecologists should undertake periodic monitoring throughout the 30 year period. Gavia ecologists will undertake botanical surveys using the condition criteria to help guide our assessments and will also review climate trends throughout. And storm geomatics can undertake further soil sampling where necessary to help ascertain whether the soil pH or nutrient levels require any adjustment in order to help inform our management. 
adaptive management is an incredibly important component of the habitat management and monitoring plan as it is intended after all to be a live document and is likely that pressures from climate change, recreation or nearby development will mean that we do have to adapt the way in which we manage habitats so that we're able to achieve the condition potential that we've set out from the outset. Using the digital twin can allow us to create a visual aid that digitises change from pre-development to the end of the 30 year management period. And that helps us to plan where and how these management adaptations need to be made in order to maximise success. By playing an active part in the long term management and monitoring, we can even surpass condition expectations. So we're now going to go through a short clip of the, one of these digital visualisations in the next slide. So, Mike, I touched on how through site survey and use of the digital twin, we can improve the way in which we monitor sites and support land managers in adapting their management where necessary. Could you be briefly talk us through this clip that we're about to see and explain how a model such as this can actually show that change and what its capabilities are in terms of long term BNG? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ella. Yeah, so so this um site you see here is actually health of flood meadow which is uh the 3d digital twin of the ordnance survey map you saw earlier you can see this is flown at a point in time so this is a really accurate record of what we've got on site at this moment in time and you can see the scrapes have been put in here um you can see some flood water from a recent flood there um there's actually a, a bank um uh, bank uh, lowering here to try and connect the river to the floodplain a little bit better. Uh, at this point, the trees weren't put in. The trees are in now. There's a whole row of orchard along here. Um, but the great thing about this is, 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 is this is a point in time. And the meadow will change year upon year. Trees will grow. Species will become richer. And this is actually a LIDAR point cloud. So each one of these is a point. So there are thousands of points in each tree. Um, and each point is colored from the corresponding pixel in a 2D ortho photo mosaic. So you, you also have a, a photo mosaic of this, a very high resolution one, where you, the pixel size is like 20 millimeters. So you could recognize dock, dock leaves, you could recognize nettles, you could recognize oxide daisies you could count them in gis if you really wanted to and this isn't ever going to overtake you know the quadrat sampling that ecologists do but it, it gives you a, a um a record of what you've got and we deliver point clouds in lots of different ways but this one here is um you would just get a, a link and you would click on the link and you would get this whole dashboard where you can do measurements across the site you can um uh, uh, manipulate the data in lots of different ways and show different things. But let's just have a quick fly through of this site because we're running out of time now. Um, so we'll fly through it in red, green and blue. And you'll see it'll switch. It'll do the same fly through showing elevation. And you'll see from from this, that you can see the flood flow paths through the meadow, you can see the high points and the low points. What you thought was a flat meadow is actually not. And you can design uh, different habitats in these different areas, depending on how low they are, because they have more water availability. So, so that's um, that's that's me done. And um, any questions? I think is it now, um, Jazz. Yeah. Any questions? Um, so I think Polly has been going to look at the, the Q&A in the chat. Yes, um, we have one question at the moment. Um, thank you to Elizabeth. Um, the question is, when inputting into a BNG led design, how do you ensure suitable habitats and plant mixes within those habitats are chosen? Do you work with specialists to refine your design to ensure the success of planting? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so I'll kick off with that one if that's OK. Um, so essentially that would start from the outset uh, with our desk and field studies um, and we would look at the soil, species and habitat data that we've collected. And this will build our understanding of the site's composition and it will essentially help aid our design um, by helping us ascertain how the site functions. 
and how it's connected to the wider landscape um, and ultimately how the landscape and species that um, that we uh, that we have assessed will benefit from the newly created and enhanced habitat. And once we actually understand the geology, the soils um, and the aspect and habitat needs for the design that we're trying to create, we can work alongside other specialists such as horticulturists um, to select appropriate native species. And, and this consultation is likely to involve a review of policy objectives as well as climate and recreational pressures so that we actually select species that that are not only locally appropriate um, and tie in with things like local nature recovery, nature recovery strategies, um, but also those which will have a greater chance of long term establishment in order to achieve the desired condition that we've set out through our uh, BNG assessment and through our habitat management and monitoring plan. Um, Mike, can I pass that question over to you now? Because um, I think it, it's worth maybe taking through um, how the digital twin is such a valuable tool to, to be used at this at this stage to help ensure that the habitats and the plant mixes we select are going to be suitably placed. Yeah, I mean, I think I think from from first hand experience um, and, and using this across quite a few disciplines, certainly ecologists are finding it useful um because they can identify the plants that are you know um locally establishing naturally and from from the river digital twin but they can also see where shading occurs um and you know what where the like you say where the, the low points in the meadow occur in that particular example so from first hand experience, we, we looked at all the different aspects. And the great thing about a River Digital Twin is it shows your whole site in context with everything around it. So that it's not an OS plan. It's an, it's an absolute replica of what you've got. And you can take any measurements that you want from that um, it, vertically as well because mostly mapping is is just horizontal but you can you can see the the vertical on the river digital twin which helps to inform um uh, different uh, potential habitats okay got... i've got one further question if i if i could please uh, ask you to consider this. Hello, what program considerations would you recommend are made for a full BNG assessment and digital twin model prior to planning consent? Are there any seasonal constraints which would be need need to be considered? Yeah, so I think um, in, in terms of seasonal constraints, um, Essentially, when we we take on a project, um, we would um, we would advise our clients on the, the the best time in which we would sh we, sh we should be assessing a site. So um, it's totally dependent on the composition. So that's where that early stage assessment comes into play. So when we look at the desk based uh, review of the site um, and we've got an understanding of the approximate composition, there may be some ha particular habitats that are quite challenging to assess and review at certain times of the year so we want to make our assessment as seasonally appropriate as as possible um but we understand that that's not always feasible in terms of, of planning um but i think you know certainly what mike's touched on with regard to the the digital twin um that that can help us enormously in picking up um you know even de species details um i don't know mike if you wanted to jump in on that one a little bit yeah i mean it Look, we, we've been so impressed with with uh, with the the lidar sensor. Um, it can penetrate through um, foliage and hit the ground, you know, extremely well. And, and we we do ground through things, so we know this. So really, at any time of year, we can go in and 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 do that. But there are advantages of actually doing it in the summer, in that you get you get a better colorization for your your digital twin you also get the bulk of your um, vegetation you can measure that from it um whereas in the winter everything is dead and it, it well it's died back and it's it's all short with it's better at getting the ground levels um but in the summer it's better at getting the vegetation um types and heights 
Um, but in terms of program, I would be, I would be, I would hope that our partnership with Gavia is accelerating um, the time it takes to go from your first um, inquiry to to getting to a to a to a desktop to a full planning application. And this is because we're consolidating um, quite a few um, specialisms into one place. And I know from experience myself with the the the, the flood meadow. Um, which was early days pilot scheme stuff. It took me two years to get from initial um, inquiry to a registered offsetting site. That's very different if you're a developer trying to um, to do an assessment on your site and and see what you've got to make up with the ten percent. Because I was actually creating an offsetting site. But I would hope that now the market is formed, that we can accelerate this process because let's face it, there isn't much time left on this planet, um, uh, the way things are going. And, 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 and I believe nature recovery um, is the only way back um, to, to bring down uh, the global temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that, Mike. I mean, our, our aim is to make our final outcome and assessment successful, um, but also we're, we're mindful of time pressures with um, our clients and, and with planning applications. And, and, and I had the same experience with some of the early projects I've worked on. They have taken an awfully long time to reach where that final point which we can confidently submit the application. Um, and I, you know, I think BNG's come an awfully long way over the last few years, and now we're in quite an exciting time in which we can ex expedite those um, assessments because of the way we we work collaboratively from the outset. So th those initial desk-based assessments through to uh, using the you know the lidar models um, that that can enhance the way in which we make those decisions right from the outset. Meaning that once we get to the design. Um, it's no longer a case of <clears throat> trying to shoehorn in um, biodiversity into an already established design. We, we know what the parameters are in which we should be working. So by the time we reach uh, you know, submission, we're confident in our design and we're, we're confident that we don't have to um, undertake multiple iterations of that design, which I, I think is a, a real um, step in the, in the right direction in, in terms of getting it right from the, from the outset. Brilliant. Thank you, Ella. Um, and one final question, as I am mindful of the time. Um, it, and the question is from Nicola, is there currently a tendency to move towards including native species of planting, given that over time we have in the UK lost swathes of particular species to targeted diseases, Dutch elm disease, as an example, many years ago? Is there a possibility to diverse the species to include non-native non-invasive options to increase the gene pool? Yeah, d definitely. I mean, uh, our focus for our design, it tends to be um, around native species and native cultivars. Um, but ultimately, that that will fact will factor that in to that those early um, stage design conversations. So where we were talking before about <clears throat> in, in refining our design and ensuring that what we select from the outset is actually achievable, it's locally appropriate and fits within things like uh, green infrastructure strategies and local nature recovery strategies, it's got to be, it's also got to be achievable in the long term. So we will look at um, climate data for that very reason. We'll also look at recreational pressures because the last thing we would want to do is to create a, you know, a really impressive biodiversity led design only to have um, large swathes of those plantings fail. Um, so I think you know, some of the studies that we've come across recently in terms of native species, many of our native species are quite successfully um, thriving in in extreme environments now so they are adapting um and there we, we do partner with um uh, external bodies and uh, nurseries who um do research into that climate resilience um but there is certainly room for a, a more co uh, qualitative assessment of, of biodiversity where there will be instances in which we have to 
to use non-native species, but those non-native species will need to be uh, appropriate to, to meet the objectives um, of, of the local area in which we're we're designing so it may be that um we know that there's uh, that we have you know heathland that's quite arid um it's it struggles with um with with rainfall now and you know it, there's a real likelihood that some of our native species won't adapt or won't adapt particularly well and we might need to look into uh, a more mediterranean mix um and whilst that may not um achieve numerically what we want it to in terms of biodiversity qualitatively it would be beneficial for pollinators and it will work with the landscape in which we're planting so uh, we have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis um but we we certainly want we certainly look at it in a holistic way and we don't sort of take a blanket approach to all of our designs okay thank you ella um well, that's just taken us to exactly 11.15, so I'd like to conclude this morning's webinar and thank everyone for attending. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, if you have any further questions, then please do just pop them in the chat now and I will ensure that the experts answer them. And rest assured, we will be sending you all a, a recording of today's webinar. Um, and if you would like to pass that on to any colleagues, you may feel benefit from it, we'd be very grateful. So thank you again for your time and um, I wish you all a very pleasant day.